When it comes to strength training for cyclists and triathletes, we've done a complete 180 going from 30 years ago to avoid it like the plague or corona, if you will, because it's going to hurt your performances to lightweight and high reps to now lift heavy stuff. I'm going to explain today and answer Brian's question as to why and how strength training is not going to convert over like the critical power chart or like your critical power numbers or FTP and how 1RM and sets of repetitions aren't the whole story and in fact they're barely scratching the surface. So if you want to learn how to actually do strength training for cyclists or triathletes, today's video is for you. To strength training for cycling or triathlon, there are a number of different considerations that we have to take. In fact, for all sports, the professional and developmental basketball players that I work with have these considerations, as do the CrossFitters that I work with. And the thing is, is that most of us don't know what we don't know. In fact, strength training is not done on a continuum. There is far more to it than you like to think or know. So today's video, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the why and how behind the strength training and why lifting light weights and high reps is not the answer, nor is lifting heavy stuff. I've covered a lot of the topics we're going to brush over today in my podcast, the Strong Savvy Cyclist and Triathlete podcast, in episodes with Doc Stu McGill, Tony Genocore, as well as Casey Hill. Now, if you're interested in listening to those, finish today's video before you pop over to the podcast and make sure you're smashing the like button down below because we've got great content for you. Strength training for cyclists and triathletes, exercises that have these many layers already programmed into them. Let's take a look at what prompted today's video. I was having a conversation in the Paladino Power Project. Now, if you're a triathlete or a runner and you are using Power, uh, the Stride Pod for your running, it is a great group and you should definitely uh, take part in that. It's a free group. Uh, Steve Paladino runs it and does a fantastic job. So Brian and I were going back and forth as someone had asked about adding barbell strength to their program and how to add it to boost their running. And this is a mistake that cyclists, triathletes, and runners all make right now because the research says that heavy lifting is beneficial. Yes, but it really, really greatly depends. So again, I've written at length at this uh, on my blog as well as covered it with the previous mentioned guests on the podcast. So let's read his uh, question here and dive into it just a little bit. If we are comfortable using course analogies, could one compare critical power and FTP with and the performance display chart with a 1RM and a similar continuum. Though critical power and 1RM are not anchored at the same point, these are nevertheless the reference points in theory. That is to say, we have a baseline from which to, uh, a relative intensity is prescribed for a duration in order to target specific stimulus. If one would consider a typical range of 1 to 10 reps, weight must decrease as reps increase. Is there not a point beyond which, in order complete repetitions, the load is no longer heavy enough to disrupt homeostasis and stimulate growth? Well, the first thing is is that it doesn't exist on a continuum, and uh, it doesn't work that way. There's actually five very interrelated pieces to strength training that we have to consider. There's strength, speed, skill, endurance, and flexibility. So these are the five uh, pieces to it, and Stone, Sands, and Sands, in their book, The Principles of... uh, of practice, principles and practice of resistance training, excuse me, trying to do it off the top of my head. Uh, they actually have a chart on like page three or four or five early in the book that shows a star of all these interrelated things. And the way it works is there's speed strength, strength speed, strength skill. All five have one of the other, right? They're all tied together. So again, uh, speed, strength, skill, endurance, and flexibility are the five. And all of these need to be related. Now, one of the first things that anybody who's gone through the HV training, strength training programs will recognize is that we don't load the system very much from the get-go. It's not one of those things where I have you complete a 1RM or a 5RM test. In fact, we start with a movement screen. Why is that that we're starting with the movement screen? We're here for weight training. Well, one of the first things we have to think about is the ability of the body to actually move itself with strength and good movement patterns, uh, or if we want to call them engrams, if we want to be super fancy about it, bing! Uh, It's one of those things that 
we really need to look at is how is the body executing that movement? And for many triathletes and cyclists, the movement patterns are greatly disrupted because we are in these unnatural positions of being in the time trial bike or on the bike for long periods of time and not using our spinal erectors, as well as just sitting in a chair like I am right now and you are probably doing as well. Or maybe you're on the trainer. If so, kudos. Now, when we get into strength training, one of the things that a lot of people don't recognize is that taking the time to set the platform correctly is the most important thing. Now, this doesn't mean we're not gonna load you, but the load doesn't have to be that much. Now, in the podcast episode, part one with Dr. Stu McGill, which I think is episode six, we talked about how a lot of cyclists injure their backs in the weight room because they're moving way too much weight that the spine and the connective tissues of the body can't handle. Now, this is a whole nother consideration that we're not gonna get into today, but I do cover over in my blog, should cyclists or when should cyclists and triathletes lift heavy weights? So if you wanna check that out, there's links down in the comment down below. While you're going down there, smash that like button, make sure you hit the bell and subscribe because we've got great content for you here. Now, when we look at the critical power or the FTP and try and compare it to the 1RM, it doesn't work that way. We're talking about comparing essentially a pineapple to a porcupine. Both of them are kind of spiky, but they're nothing like one another. When you look at a 1RM, you're going to get a, a percentage, and those percentages give us a rough idea as to what major changes we're gonna have in the body and the tissues. It's not gonna tell us about how we're gonna change the hormones, it's not gonna tell us how we're gonna change the firing patterns, and it's certainly not gonna tell us how we're gonna improve your movements, right? It also doesn't tell us about are you able to control in one area in order to get movement in another, or as Dr. McGill says, uh, proximal stiffness for distal motion. And the answer is no, it's not gonna tell you that. It's just gonna tell you, well, in order to get these specific tissue adaptations, you need to do this. It also doesn't tell you how much rest time do you need in between strength sessions in order to allow the proper adaptations to occur to allow you to actually improve. And this is something that endurance athletes are absolutely awful at. We like to think that in order for us to improve, we need to go out and just kill ourselves. And we heard this in another podcast. Uh, Trevor Connor was on. Uh, if you're familiar with Fast Talk, uh, he's one of the, the hosts. Fantastic podcast. I've had the pleasure of been, being on there. So I decided to have him on mine. And he tells this great story about going out with a couple of the pros. And they said, 200 watts today, that's what we're doing. And he's going up a hill and he hit 280, 300, 320. And he's like slobbering at the top. And he's so he feels so accomplished. And then a couple of minutes later, one of the guys that he's riding with just comes up alongside him and says, you know, he's expecting, you know, kudos, great job. You did awesome. Wow, you're so strong. And they say, if you ever do that again, you're never coming with us. And he's like, well, I... And I've made that mistake also, <laughs> so not exempt. The point is, is that we like to think that hard work is the way to get there because that's what we see. At Strava and all these other places, look at the power numbers. Well, in fact, what we actually need is adaptation. We need to have just enough stimulus in order to get that adaptation. And when it comes to strength training, it doesn't work based off of the load. It matters how you're getting the movement. And this is one of the reasons why practicing breathing and breathing in different positions and understanding the difference between diaphragmatic breathing and doing the accessory muscle breathing is so absolutely pivotal in helping you to be able to move better. It's also why we focus a lot on the feet and on the shoulders and on the lats and the chest and the shoulders again. A lot of us don't think about that as being cycling or triathlon related, but it 100% is. Now let's get back to Brian's question. So when we look at the 1RM, and we try and put it onto a continuum. Again, all that's telling us is about the tissue adaptations we're going to get and the nervous system adaptations. And what this off, often happens or what often leads to for cyclists and triathletes is that you are just going to load yourself up and you're going to add layers of bad movement with load on top of bad movement patterns already. Over time, this leads to joints being out of position. And as we've heard in my strength training for triathlon success course on Training Peaks University, joint position, dictates muscle function. Now, if you took that course, you're gonna recognize that and you go, muscle function. It's one of those things that is so important for us to be able to understand that it's not just doing the exercise and adding load. In fact, most of us as cyclists and triathletes have very little right in owning or moving anything more than an eight kilo or 12 kilo kettlebell or an empty barbell. This has to do with how we're executing the movements. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the comparison to critical power and 1RM. Now the critical power in 1RM, Brian, 
Yeah, actually we can compare those two because it is going to change in intensity as you go from the heavyweights or 100% of critical power all the way down. The same is gonna happen as you go through your sets. You're gonna change from a neuromuscular uh, adaptation or neural drive from one to three quick, fast repetitions to being much more metabolic as you go further down uh, into that spectrum of sets and reps. Now the other thing to note here is you mentioned one to 10 repetitions. That is a small sliver of the strength training spectrum. In fact, we can do, and some of us need to do, repetitions all the way up until 80 or 100 reps if we actually wanna have endurance adaptations of those movements. Now, this is talked about in Dr. Mel, uh, uh, sorry, Mel Sif and uh, Verkachansky's book, Super Training. Uh, so Verkachansky, is, his textbook is like this thick, small print, 1960s, 1970s, I think is when it came out. And all of the best coaches in the world that I've had the opportunity to meet or talk to all reference back to this textbook and have it in as required reading for many of their interns as they go through. Now you may be wondering, how is a textbook from the 1970s relevant today when we have all this research? Well, a lot of the research is looking at what he talks about in the book or trying to disprove it. And yeah, we've learned that there are some things that need to change and the body doesn't quite work that way. But for the most part, a lot of these old school training books are very pertinent and very, <laughs> very adaptable to what we're doing today. Why is that important? Because a lot of these things have been known for a long time and the research often just follows down. What's popular? What do people expect? And in fact, there's something called a publishing bias. And again, I talk about this over in the Strong Savvy Cyclist and Triathlete podcast in how to read a research article. And I'll have that link down below. I can't remember, I think it's in the 40s or 30s, that episode. Uh, but really, there is a bias for publishing as well as the studies are often carried out on college age males because that's an easy captive audience and it's only done for short amounts of time. No. I am not sitting here preaching or standing on the soapbox saying don't use research. I am saying that I went from being 100% show me the research, this is what we're gonna do, to learning from my mentors and my experiences over the last 15 plus years of, well, that's one research article and when you actually read the research article, it worked really well for seven of the participants but the other three saw no results. But the P is greater than 0.05, so thus it's relevant. You've gotta learn how to read the articles and understand what exactly they're saying. Now let's go down to what Brian's talking about with uh, not lifting heavy enough to disrupt homeostasis. Now which homeostasis are you talking about? Are we talking about the hormonal uh, homeostasis? Are we talking about how you're able to move? Are we working on strength endurance? Is the movement breaking down? Which homeostasis are we talking about? Tissue homeostasis is the one I'm going to guess because that was uh, what you're talking about leading up to that. But there are so many other things we need to think about. For example, in my 60-day home body weight program, which we uh, put together here for Corona, because a lot of people got stuck at home uh, back in March and April 2020, they needed to work out. They were asking me, hey, do you have a program with no weights? I don't have anything at home. The 90-90 single leg deadlift is incredibly challenging. And the reason it's challenging is because we're disrupting the homeostasis of how the body is actually carrying a movement out. They're not able to separate the hips while keeping a 90 degree angle in through the back knee and moving the hips and rib cage together. So in that case, we've disrupted the homeostasis of the normal neural firing. Not the homeostasis you're talking about, but that's one we have to think about. So many different things that we have to consider when it comes to strength training, right? It's getting a little bit boring, but this is what really takes behind the scenes. Now we're fast forward just a little bit to the end of Brian's post here. Now, he's asking about the within the 10 rep range, he sees conventional reading suggesting that the two avenues of hypertrophy are expressed in the relation to load, repetitions, and set, which is what we just talked about. And he goes on to ask about sar sarcoplasmic adaptation or hypertrophy and myofibrillar hypertrophy. Now, bodybuilders are getting that sarcoplasmic where they're, they're blowing up. The muscles are getting much bigger, but they're not having much more contractile strength. However, Olympic lifters and we as cyclists want the myofibrillar adaptation. What that is, is the actual contractile properties of the muscle. So best example I can give of that I know of uh, is one of the coaches at CrossFit Tel Aviv, uh, Yoni. He's probably about five foot two, maybe 63 kilos, and he is now clean and jerking from the floor over 100 kilos. Now, if you walked into the gym and you saw him wearing a t-shirt and it's board shorts, you look at him standing next to the bar being like, he's probably gonna hurt himself. I mean, he looks pretty strong, but he's probably gonna hurt himself, right? Especially if he tells you, hey, I'm doing a clean and jerk with 110 kilos, but he can do it. He has that explosive strength. He's able to get the nervous system to fire, create stiffness in certain areas while getting movement only from the hips and from the shoulders. That's what we're really after. 
But that takes a long time to develop, and it's something that a lot of cyclists and triathletes are not comfortable or willing to do. You've got to take the time to be able to learn how to move much better. Now, when we go into the gym and we think, lift heavy stuff, there's a problem with this. And that is that in order for us to actually maintain that strength longer, it, the maximal strength needs to be built on a foundation of hypertrophy. Let me say that again. Maximal strength or lifting heavy stuff needs to be built on a foundation of hypertrophy. Now, this is something uh, that is spoken about in super training with uh, Verkachansky and Sif, but it's very true. And this is one of the reasons why we have the five stages of strength training throughout the entire training year. And this is another mistake cyclists and triathletes make. They go to the gym, they get themselves super sore for two and a half, three months out of the year, and then they drop it the rest of the year. Well, if you do that, you're never going to see adaptation. That would be like me taking you in... September and training really hard all the way until February and then saying, oh, you're doing the Tour de France? Listen, we hit February. I don't want you to ride your bike anymore. We've got all the adaptations that we need. You need to rest and recover because you can't be too sore. So we're just going to ride your single speed to the cafe and back every week and that's it. You'd fire me as your coach. I really hope so. But yet that's what cyclists and triathletes are doing. They're doing strength training, making themselves sore as opposed to improving throughout the year. Now the five stages of strength adaptation are anatomical adaptation. This is just where we're getting the connective tissues ready, starting to move a little bit better. Then we have hypertrophy, and a lot of cyclists are scared of this. And yet, triathletes as well, that is where the vast majority of strength training for cycling or triathlon programs is going to live. They live in the 10 to 15 repetition range. So Brian, if we look at uh, any good strength training for cycling program that is popular out there, chances are you're gonna see sets of 10 to 15. We're working on endurance at sets of 15. No, you're not, you're doing hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is anywhere from five to 15 repetitions. If you really wanna work on endurance, we're talking about sets of 25 to 80. Think about that, 80. That's a lot of repetitions. It also needs to be done at a certain tempo. So these are all considerations that tie into that star that we talked about at the beginning here with stone, sands, and sands, and that is uh, strength, speed, skill, flexibility, and endurance. Those are the five parts that we have to think about. Now, let's focus on the skill part. We're talking about improving movement patterns. Now, it's not sexy, it's not gonna sell lots of copies, and probably most of you have clicked off of this YouTube video already, but if you haven't, make sure, again, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon so that you know exactly when we release our videos. Well, they're every Wednesday right now, so you can also check back, but subscribe. Now. As we go through and we think about skill, this is one of the biggest things that cyclists and especially triathletes are missing, is that is the skill of running, the skill of riding, the skill of swimming. Now, triathletes tend to do pretty well in hitting the pool and putting in their meters, but taking the time to actually focus on stroke development, positioning, and making it so that you glide through the water is not as much of a focus as just getting in your metabolic work or doing sets of 10 by 50 at increasing pace on two, 20 seconds or whatever it may be. I hit my times today, great. Your times are exactly as they were three years ago. Why do you think that is? Well, I'm getting older. Mm, let's take a look and see how you've done with your stroke and positioning refinement. How much have you spent on getting faster in the water by using less effort? Well, I don't really have time for that. I just go to masters every morning or twice a week. Well, if you spend about 15 minutes a day when you're in the pool, that's a half hour a week, that's two hours a month of improving your stroke, your position, and your ability to go through the water with less, less resistance. Over the course of a year, let alone three years, that adds up really big, but it takes focused, purposeful practice. Malcolm Gladwell talks about this. This is also the missing part for a lot of people when they look at Erickson's 10,000 hours. Now back to as it relates for today, that skill, riding a bike is a skill. A lot of us just get on and pedal. I'm totally guilty of that but learning how to break, corner, use your gears properly, and be able to climb or to sprint, uh, or to stay nice and solid in the saddle is absolutely pivotal, yet almost none of us practice it. Every time that I've ever held a skill session for a team that I coached, literally two thirds of the team find a reason that they couldn't make it. Oh, it was too hot. Oh, I stayed up an extra 30 seconds last night. I couldn't fall asleep. Uh, my bike was pointing the other way when I woke up this morning, so I decided it was an omen that I shouldn't show up. True story. There are so many different things that we need to work on that just aren't sexy. It's not me deadlifting 300 kilos on the internet or me saying, oh, I went up another two and a half pounds a week and I'm now able to deadlift 150 pounds. How much you lift does not matter. And that's where we're gonna wrap up today's uh, video. Now, I know I've gone on for a little bit, 
But let's recap everything that we've talked about. Number one is strength training is not a, on a continuum of percentage of one RM and repetitions. That's such a small sliver of what we actually need to think about. We need to think about how you're executing the movement. Are you able to keep stiffness in some parts in order to get movements at the right parts and have the right muscles firing through that range of motion? We also talked about movement and how breathing can affect that. Having the different type of breathing exercises can help you lock or unlock different parts of the body, allowing you to move better, more efficiently, and to produce proximal stiffness for distal motion, making you more efficient and thus stronger without actually changing your strength at all. You don't need a lot of weight. So your excuse of I don't have enough weight at home to work out to do strength training properly is moot. It's how you do it. Tempos that you're lifting, the movement patterns that you're doing. But that's going to take focus, purpose, or practice and you can't put that on Instagram or YouTube and have lots of people give you likes and applause. Hmm. Choose your poison. Do you want to be able to perform better or look better on social? If you want to look better on social, that's totally cool. Not our thing here at Human Vortex Training. So if you're looking for flashy videos and you're looking for like, oh, that's amazing, that's crazy, or that's a crazy hard exercise, uh, go down and hit the unsubscribe button because you're not going to get that here. You will get sound scientifically founded or traditionally founded strength training programs that will work because the research hasn't been printed yet that it actually works. In fact, Mike Boyle, really highly respected functional strength training coach with over 25 or 30 years at this point of experience, says that if you follow the research, you're five to 10 years behind what the best in the biz are doing. And I found that to be true. Let's wrap up the last little bit. And that is talking about uh, the five stages of adaptation throughout the year. So we have anatomical adaptation, we have hypertrophy, we have max strength, then you have transition to sport and then maintenance. Now these are the five stages, generally with cyclists and triathletes, like you and me that aren't professional or trying to go pro, we'll go through four of those, where we'll go through anatomical adaptation, three to six weeks, we're learning the movement, letting things kind of calm down after the cycling season or the triathlon season. Then we have hypertrophy, which can be anywhere from six to 10 weeks, yeah, six to 10 weeks of hypertrophy, but we're not looking for the big muscle uh, gain, we're looking for the strength gain. Then we go into max power, because as we heard, from Verkashansky and Sif, which is true that if you want those max strength gains to stick around, they've got to be built on that foundation of hypertrophy. After that, we have the transition to sport, and this is where we would do much shorter time in through the weight room, uh, but we would still be doing power. And in fact, I have a 55-year-old male uh, cyclist who's been riding for over a decade. He just set his all-time 25-minute best FTP at 255 with a power to heart rate ratio of 1.6% or lower. That's insane, like at 55, riding the best he ever has at a lower power to heart rate ratio. So if you know those numbers, they really pop out at you. You're like, wow, how is that even possible? The best part, heaviest weight he's used, 16 kilos. And we've been working together for a year and a half. Now we're talking about getting a barbell rack and weights, just now, because he's gonna need it in six months. Not right now, in six months. That's how long it takes when you do it properly. So that's it for today's video. I know that it went a little bit long. I also have a longer video about the exercise progression and the four pillars of athletic progression. So make sure you are subscribing down below or you can click on that video, which is gonna be somewhere back here. Now, if you found this information today to be useful, head on over to the Human Vortex Training blog, subscribe to the video down here or to the channel here after watching this video, watch one of the other videos up on the screen and leave your comments down below. Did you know this? Have you been doing heavy weight training and just getting sore and not seeing gains in your bike? Uh, such as, what was it, 50, 54 watts, 64 watts in six months? Comment down below, and if you're fed up with just this general strength training program and you actually wanna get stronger for cycling or triathlon, send a comment down below or shoot me an email, Brody, B as in boy, R-O-D as in dog, I-E, at humanvortextraining.com. Till next time, remember, train smarter, not harder, not to get sore, not to add more weight to the bar, because it is all about you and your performances on the bike or in multi-sport.